Alrighty, so I'll try to do this without the mic and then you'll tell me if I need to have the mic. Okay, so yes, uh, I have uh, folks in this audience who know more about these topics than I do and so anytime you need to chime in to get me back on the rails, please do. Let me tell you what I'm gonna do for this first um, session. I'm gonna talk to you about the main frameworks for moral analysis, deontology and consequentialism. And then I'm gonna throw in virtue ethics for good measure. No, this doesn't work like that, okay, up there. Um, I'm gonna throw in virtue ethics because I think that it's enhancing of those two moral theories. And at the end, after I've given you the, you know, dummy's guide to moral theory, then we'll look at two cases in neuroethics and we'll see how deontology and consequentialism would look at both of those cases. And that'll be your job and we'll work together on that. So I'm going to start with consequentialism and partly I start with, I sh uh, she's already outed me here as a deontologist, so let's just admit that straight up. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I can't persuade you that consequentialism is a spectacular framework for moral analysis. The reason I start with consequentialism is that, and the consequentialist will attest to this, it is easier to understand. In fact, one of the things that uh, consequentialists say is that its simplicity, its, its, uh, its elegance, is part of the reason why it ought to be the reigning framework to do moral analysis. There are famous bioethicists on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, both consequentialist and deontology. Um, I'll talk about a couple of them when I get that far. And one of the things to remember about these two frameworks is that they are the way that you approach moral analysis. They don't have anything to do with what your opinions will be when you get to the other side of the analysis. In other words, you could be a consequentialist and be pro-choice, and you could be a deontologist and be pro-choice, and you would have different paths to that conclusion, but it does not predetermine uh, what decision you'll make about a moral question based on what moral framework you use for analysis. All this is, is basically a method. When you see a moral problem, how do you attack it? What are the, the reasoning processes you use? And I'm actually gonna take a pretty hard line here and I'm gonna say in the world, and I mean backwards, forwards, in the present, there are two ways of doing moral analysis and they do not overlap. Some of you who know as much as I do about this are already saying, oh, that's not true about rule consequential. We can ask those kind of detailed questions later. But the basic story is this. You either use moral analysis that is deontological or you do moral analysis that is consequentialist. And because those two frameworks are so different in the way they approach moral problems, you can't be both at the same time. That is the strong position I'm gonna take on this. Okay, enough about that. What actually is this thing that we're talking about, consequentialism? A lot of my PowerPoint is going to be fairly heady uh, phrases that I will read and then I'm going to help us parse out and analyze. So let's get a definition here of consequentialism. Consequentialism is the view that the value of an action, the moral permissibility, the moral worth, the thumbs up or thumbs down that you give to any question, should I do it or not? That's the moral value is going to be derived, is going to be determined entirely based on the consequences that are gonna happen because of your choice. Ought I to conduct this experiment with these people under this circumstance? Well, what will the consequences be? The consequences near and far, short term, long term. What are the risks and the benefits? What, are the, what is the overall package of outcomes, both positive and negative? That's consequentialism. If you want to know, is consequentialism, in, in, in consequentialism, should I do a particular action, then you're going to look at the consequences. And if on balance, think about a scale, the decision you're going to make will create more a heavier side of positives than negatives, then in fact it is the right thing to do. If the consequences are good or the best possible, then the action is right. It's morally right to do. If the consequences are bad and they are outweighed by the, they are, uh, the negatives outweigh the positives, then 
the action is wrong. Right and wrong is determined entirely based on this scale, those old fashioned scales of whether on balance the consequences will be good or on balance the consequences will be bad. Consequentialism, therefore, is a maximizing strategy. You're not just trying to create good outcomes from option one and good outcomes from the antithesis option two. You're trying to create the best possible set of outcomes. You're trying to maximize, and this is a phrase you've probably heard, the greatest good for the greatest number. You are trying to get the overall on balance best set of outcomes thinking as broadly as you possibly can. Now that's going to be consequentialism's strength and it's going to be sometimes its liability because when you're trying to create the maximum amount of good from the actions you're doing, that makes a pretty high bar for your actions, for your behavior, and for, for your conduct. But it is a maximizing strategy. So if you've got two outcomes, and they both would be pretty good, there are really very few negative outcomes for either option. They're not both right. What's right is what will be on balance the greatest maximum benefit. And that's how you make that decision. Whereas you're going to see in deontology, you can get a lot of rights. In consequentialism, we may have a hard time figuring out what on balance will be the absolute best option, but there is going to be a right. And the right is going to be the side that has the biggest bang for the consequence buck. Now that said, it's going to mean that there aren't any class of actions, betrayal, killing innocent children, torturing animals, that are automatically off the table. Everything is on the table. Oh, it doesn't usually come to that. Mostly consequentialists and deontologists agree, and that's why we're all sitting here in a semicircle, we're not beating each other, and it's all good, because most of the time we are operating under the same set of circumstances and facts, and it turns out to be the case that actions that deontologists think are morally right because they are in principle correct are also those things that lead to the best possible outcomes. So mostly we agree on most things, especially in our ordinary behavior, like how do you conduct yourself in a neuroethics boot camp? We're all going to be on the same page. But nothing is in principle off the table. And if it should come to be the case that torturing someone will create the best uh, consequences, the overall greatest good for the greatest number, well, then it's something that has to be considered. So no action is off the table, and there isn't going to be any general class of action like lying that you can't even consider. So you can't argue that slavery or torture or killing of animals for fun is morally wrong in and of itself. You will argue it's wrong but you won't argue it's wrong in and of itself, on principle. So let's think about some of the standard, stock almost, uh, examples that philosophers love to use when they think about these two theories. If it will bring about more good to kill an innocent person, because maybe five, ten, a million people will be saved, then if that is in fact true, killing that innocent person will have been justified doesn't usually come to this. As I said, usually we don't act, have to make those choices. In fact, I could do a poll, but I don't need to. How many times did you actually have the circumstance in your life where you were standing there saying, I got to either kill her or all these other people are going to die? We just don't have those kind of, let's call them, moral opportunities. Mostly our life is quite ordinary. But you could quickly go to a wartime circumstance, and you would easily be able to find these kind of, of, of uh, you know, calculations that are required, and research sometimes asks for some of these tough calculations. Ordinary life often doesn't, certainly, thank goodness, not when it comes to killing people. Now, what are you trying to maximize? What are you trying to get the greatest amount of when you're trying to make your decisions about right and wrong? There have been many moral theorists who have thought about various things we're trying to maximize, and that's a list of a bunch of the choices sometimes that philosophers have made. Like, I'm trying to maximize pleasure. So that's called hedonistic. 
consequentialism. You think about what is it that constitutes pleasure in human life, and, and I don't mean just the base pleasures. Believe me, the philosophers are all over this, not just you know the old guys, John Stuart Mill, Peter Singer, some of the contemporary philosophers. They're not thinking about pleasure in a very narrow sense. They're thinking about it in a broad sense. Nevertheless, what they're trying to maximize in the world is pleasure, and what they're trying to minimize is pain. Or you could be a welfare consequentialist, and you're trying to define what is human welfare, what is human well-being. And when we think about that, then we're trying to think about our actions as constituting the maximization of human well-being or welfare. Well, the reason I have utility in bold there is because the first formal consequentialist, now you know if I think that in the world, Sorry. If I think in the world that there are two modes of moral analysis, and I think those modes of moral analysis have existed for a long time, then it can't be the case that consequentialism was invented by Jeremy Bentham or John Stuart Mill in the, in the 19th century. So no, I don't. So I'm going to talk about the first formal articulation of consequentialism. But the first formal articulation, and it started with Jeremy Bentham, I'll give you a slide in a second to get you some dates was uh, um, in that formulation, Bentham was thinking about utility as that which we're trying to get the most of. Now that's a hard word for us today because we think of the utility bill. So we don't have, we don't think utility in that same sense. And thanks to the consequentialists, uh, to the deontologists, when we think about the utility of someone uh, to us, what is your utility to me, we get nervous about, does that mean I'm using you? So it doesn't have the right tone the way that it did when Bentham created it. Nevertheless, utility was the way in which the, uh, the theory was structured and it created the theory called, and you're familiar with it, utilitarianism. How does utilitarianism relate to consequentialism? Because there is this big umbrella under which there are many little types of consequentialism. Utilitarianism is one of those types, just like hedonistic consequentialism or welfare consequentialism are included under that umbrella. Utilitarianism doesn't sound like the others, that's because it's an artifact that is quite old, and these other forms of consequentialism have been derived in, mostly in the 20th century rather than the 19th. But this was first articulated by Jeremy Bentham, and then more richly by John Stuart Mill. So only people who are interested in the history of thought read Bentham. I think that's fair to say to the philosophers around the table, but it is actually folks learning about consequentialism who really still read John Stuart Mill. Incredibly sophisticated articulation. So in, cons in utilitarianism, the idea was to create the greatest utility for the greatest number, and you were to think about what utility some action had for you and others in the world in terms of units. And those units were utils. And that's where we get this idea. Now that is an odd way in some sense to think about moral behavior. And yet, when we get fast forward 150 years to Peter Singer, he's really Peter Singer, whose famous work on animal ethics um, will be something we talk about throughout this uh, couple of hours. But um, when we think about someone like Peter Singer, he really is talking about something at least metaphorically quantifiable about what kind of benefit the various stakeholders in a decision are going to get. And you could think about them, if you wanted to, in terms of utils. He's, uh, Peter Singer's going to think about them in terms of the quantity of pleasure and the minimization of pain you have, but utils is just a perfectly fine way to try to think quantitatively, even though you know you can't fully do that, if you had to assign a value to how much benefit would be um, accrued by a certain choice and how much uh, detriment or disadvantage, then you could think in a calculus where you would use something like a utile. At any rate, that's why it's called utilitarianism, and it was really this very fairly broad understanding of what we're trying to maximize, as opposed to the welfare consequentialists, where they were really trying to avoid people saying things like, I get a great deal of pleasure out of being very, very rich. Well, how much utility do you get versus how much utility would somebody else get? So pleasure is quite subjective. Uh, I remember saying in a graduate class when I was a PhD student, well, 
I have a wonderful Taylor guitar, mother of pearl all around and everything, and I get so much pleasure out of it that I deserve the $4,000 guitar, even though that would buy a lot of UNICEF biscuits. But you know what? Those UNICEF biscuits don't taste that good. So if you spread out all the little tiny pleasure you get from that UNICEF biscuit, you won't go anywhere near the amount of unbelievable pleasure I get from the Taylor guitar. So it's, it's because of you know, smart alecky graduate students with those kind of hypotheticals that utilitarianism isn't as much in favor as something more rich, like welfare consequentialism, where you couldn't possibly say that your true welfare in the world, your ability to feed yourself, clothe yourself, educate yourself, is contingent on your having that Taylor guitar. Okie doke. Modern day uh, bioethicists who are consequentialists. I've already said Peter Singer, Art Kaplan would be another great example. I like to do that because I want to make sure that you know that in the world that we're in, in the world of, of, of applicable um, uh, concrete bioethics, we have folks who are, uh, are clearly using these approaches. Though you could actually trace what folks, what approach people are taking by the way they argue. How do you uh, label someone as a consequentialist as opposed to a deontologist? You're going to see this so crisply when we get to the cases because we're going to do a consequentialist analysis and a deontological analysis. But the answer to your question is, how do you think through the problem? So in fact, I love that question. So the question is, can't Peter Singer do both? So if you think about his famous paper, Famine, Affluence, and Morality, uh, you, you can watch him using language like duty in that paper, which will be squarely in the camp of deontologists. The question is, does he think that, that following one's duties is how one ought to live one's life? Or does he think that if he's going to convince Autumn Feaster to give up almost all of her money, which is what he's basically arguing in this paper, to the point where my marginal utility is, you know, is at the same point as all the folks who, who are starving and have no houses, if he's going to convince Autumn the deontologist, he's going to have to speak in deontological terms. Think about it like this. There's basketball and there's baseball. If you want to win against somebody who's playing baseball, you'll have to use the small round ball rather than the big round ball. But that doesn't mean left to your own devices. You wouldn't be preferring to play basketball. So Peter Singer is a consequentialist. And when he makes his big argument about animals, he argues from a consequentialist perspective. Can he understand what it's like to play on the other turf? Absolutely he can, as can any of you once you understand how both systems work. And if you know that you're trying to convince someone who's from the other camp, you'll have no choice but to make arguments that are in the form that resonate with them. So let's talk about um, the uh, how do you create the calculus, the calculation? It depends on the consequentialist you are. But famously, for example, Peter Singer argued that animals had to be part of the equation, especially if you're a hedonistic consequentialist where you think about pleasure and pain. I'm not going to tell you, you're going to tell me because you're the neuro folks, but I think at least from the lay perspective, it does seem that animals experience pain. And, and if they do, then they have to be part of the calculation when we're thinking about, for example, a research protocol that would involve animals. They have to somehow figure in. It's going to turn out that consequentialism can deal so much more coherently with animals and what to do about animals and what are, uh, what we, how we ought to treat animals than the deontologist can. Because we could, once we know enough neuroscience, we, or as the science evolves, we can actually try to figure out what the experience when we, in, when we have them in certain types of, exper of experiments, for example, or in certain types of lives. Um, we can also assign different values to the way that the stakeholders are going to experience an action or even what the long-term consequences will be of choosing one stakeholder over another stakeholder. For example, in my last case here, uh, if you're tr having to choose to give an organ to, to one of two children, is it fair game to, think, to, to ask yourself, whether this child should get it because this child has the potential to cure cancer, whereas this child uh, really looks quite pathological and could end up being a serial killer. Let's just imagine we could know we had a good predictive value. Would that be the right kind of way to go about deciding on organ allotment? And there used to be actually committees called the God Committees that did think in those very terms about, about the scarce resource of organ um, distribution.
So let's think, uh, before we turn to deontology, a couple of other things. Let's think about this thing called the famous lifeboat experiment. Imagine that you've got a lifeboat. Philosophers love these things. Um, they're called thought experiments. They're always so crazy, and that's part of how you remember them, because they're so eccentric. Uh, but let's imagine that you have a lifeboat, and it has four slots on it, four places. Who do you pick to be in that lifeboat? The rescue dog, the 90-year-old man with severe dementia, the healthy one-year-old child, a chimpanzee, a 40-year-old scientist, the 35-year-old woman with Down syndrome. Consequentialists can coherently debate this. They will have to debate it because it's not as if consequences just lay themselves at your feet. You'll see that when we engage in the case discussion. But you can, as a consequentialist, coherently talk through this lifeboat, maybe agreeing, maybe not. You'll find the deontologists are almost stutter when they get to a lifeboat um, case like this. We'll see. All right, what are the strengths of consequentialism? Well, for one thing, it has a simplicity. You now have it. You have it now uh, pretty much encapsulated in what I just did in 10 minutes. It is very st streamlined. It is very straightforward. It is an, uh, um, a, a, a very uh, understandable strategy for how do you do moral analysis. There is a clarity to it and an elegance, which consequentialists recognize about themselves. It's also very intuitive in hard cases. If you really only had to torture one person to spare a million people the loss of their lives, is it really wrong? To, no matter how much pain you cause that person and the loved ones for all the trauma that would be the ripple effect or you know, if the person actually died, that person's death, could that really on this scale of a million on the one hand save lives and this torture of a person on the other, is it not obvious what one should do from a, a, a cost benefit, a consequence perspective? It is quite obvious. I often like to talk about fruit. So if you think about the one person, every person being a kumquat, let's say, one million kumquats over here and one kumquat on the other side, look at your scale. It's very clear. So in these hard cases, consequentialism can be very intuitive. I want to, us to, to note a, a little uh, footnote here about consequentialism. It would be very easy to be a coarse consequentialist. You look at one consequence, one dimension, and you weigh in your balance and you make your decision. Consequentialists uh, very much chafe at simplistic. Remember, I said it had a simplicity to it. That doesn't make it simplistic. If you're really going to think about the consequences of a particular action, a nuanced consequentialism is going to, a consequentialist is going to have to think about the consequences right now for these people, later, 10 years, for all of the people that will be affected by those people. It is in no way simple to come up with the calculus. But there is no other way for the nuanced consequentialist to think through the moral problem. You simply can't make uh, just one axis of, of risk benefit and ignoring all the others because you wouldn't have the complete picture of what the consequences will be. Like a lie today, uh, where was I last night, says my partner. Um, well, I was at the movies. Uh, what, that lie may actually be the best thing to say to my partner in that circumstance. But what does it do to my relationship? What does it do to my own self-esteem? The ripple effect could be far and wide. So when you think about the consequences, it's very important to give consequentialism its proper respect and due. We have to think about the, these ripple effects. But then that's the question, how far out do you go? If you wanted to think, for example, about the wisdom of having, of engaging in a particular war, would you think about whether uh, you uh, have a high probability of making things better by having this war? Do you want to think about what the literal consequences were at that time, in a year, in 10 years? What if we learned that because of a certain event 100 years ago that didn't look like a good idea, the world is tremendously better off. So consequentialism does have to struggle a little bit with how far out do you, uh, do you put your parameters. Another problem of consequentialism is its demandingness. People often think because it sometimes 
looks like it's making calculations about people's lives. Oh, you're too costly because you're quadriplegic. You know, those kind of calculations. It looks a little bit moral rogue, a little bit scathing. Actually, consequentialism is an extraordinarily high bar morally. Because if you think about maximizing the greatest good for the greatest number for the actions that you have under your control, then you're asking yourself about that cup of coffee that you bought at Starbucks. And you're saying to yourself, was that the best thing that could have been done with the money I spent on the mochaccino? Or was there something else that could have been done? And each consequentialist will have to settle those questions in her own life about where are you going to draw the line about your actions and what consequences they could produce out in the world. And then its final uh, concern is that nothing is off the table. Not torture, not betrayal, not lying or cheating or stealing. It doesn't usually come to that, but nothing is off the table. Everything is in bounds. All right, that's phase one. Phase two, deontology. Deontology comes from the Greek word deontos, duty, what must be done. Actions are right or wrong based on the set of obligations the set of duties and principles that the individual holds herself to. What are my, what is the set, what are the set of, of moral obligations I recognize in my life? And then I ask myself, if I lie to my partner tonight and I hold the principle, thou shalt not lie, haven't I then violated my own moral obligation? Uh, De deontologists will talk about lots of different types of moral entities, but they all basically, for our purpose, mean the same thing. I could talk about obligations, I could talk about moral considerations, I could talk about duties or principles. It's all the same structure. Here's the obligation, here's the action. Does the action conform to my principle? Is the action consistent with what I hold my principles or obligations to be? It was, in my opinion, uh, best articulated, uh, or most sophisticatedly articulated up to that point at least, by Immanuel Kant. And the basic idea is this. Each and every human being has infinite value, not finite value. Finite value can be traded off. You could say, well, here's a finite value. Here's a lot of other finite values. There's five finite values here and one finite value here, and that's more than that. Infinity does not lend itself to any type of calculation or comparison, because infinity and infinity is infinity. So if you have an infinite worth over here, that's infinity, and you have five infinite worths over here, that's infinity, that's equal. And that's why those hard cases are very, very hard, because what would it mean to kill him to save those five? It would mean sacrificing an infinite for an infinite. And so deontologists don't know what to do because there is a, uh, an obligation, thou shalt not kill. Now, I'm only using biblical terms because I find that it's the easiest to convey because the, the, the commandments are commandments. They command. But there is nothing inherently religious about deontology. The, the, in fact, Kant, though the son of a minister, was a secular moral philosopher, as most are. Okay, the bottom... The principle at root, the core principle, is called the categorical imperative, as articulated by Kant. And it's very highfalutin, as almost everything in deontology is. And it, is like, it goes like this. Act in a way that the action you're doing could become a universal law so that everybody would be doing that action at any time. Act in a way such that your action could become a universal law of nature without contradiction. That's the categorical imperative. But if that feels hard to, to swallow with, with a half an hour remaining of moral theory, then just this, do unto others as you want others to do unto you. If it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. Now, the reason I'm poking a little bit of fun here and making the categorical imperative look like the golden rule is because this thing has been found in every culture. There is this understanding that the standards I, I hold myself to and the standards that I hold other people to really ought to be the same. Now Kant wrote tomes explaining why that's true, but the basic idea is this. If you have infinite value and I have in infinite value, then there is a certain type of respect and a certain type of, of, of duty to those other fellow infinites, other entities of infinite value. I owe you that. In fact, there's a book by a very famous moral philosopher at Harvard called What We Owe to Each Other. And 
Kantian would add, and to oneself. Because one of the things that's interesting about Kant's uh, deontolo deontological theory is if, if we're all infinite, then I'm infinitely valuable too. So I actually have obligations to myself. For example, to not take this infinite value off the earth. That is a prohibition against suicide. Whole bunch of prohibitions, thou shalt not kill and steal and cheat and torture. And a whole bunch of thou shalts. Help others, respect oneself, develop one ta one's talents. And then I'll talk about this in a second, a whole bunch of virtues. And uh, in a minute, I'll explain how those two things come together. But there is no finite number of principles or obligations that one has, that, that has already been predetermined to govern human life. There's a foundational principle, the categorical imperative, and as we learn more about each other and ourselves, we are in an ever-expanding suitcase, arsenal of moral tools. So some of the moral tools are actually pre the articulation of deontology, like those virtues. For example, justice and uh, courage and temperance are three of the cardinal virtues of ancient Greece. But the, as we come to understand more about the way that we thrive, the way that we, the way that we need to interact in order to, um, to, to, to um, flourish in our lives and, and the lives that we want for others, we add more and more obligations to that set. Like what? Like when some of you were children, bullying was an annoyance, but it wasn't a pathological crime. Today, bullying is understood as a traumatic event for the person who's on the receiving end, and I believe rightly so. In fact, many of us who were bullied under the old days where bullying didn't rise to that level, didn't get the kind of attention and, 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 and restitution, at, let alone revenge, that it really demands when you are that vulnerable and you are that much under siege. Today, we understand, thou shalt not bully. It's not in the Ten Commandments. It wasn't in my school, not that many years ago. Now, today, there are laws about bullying. Why? Because it hurts, and it hurts badly, and it hurts long term. The more we understand about ourselves, the more obligations we recognize. There's a movie, um, uh, I, well, I guess there's two movies called Wit, but I'm thinking about the French one, where um, the, uh, the, the plot there is to try to help people under, understand that witticisms act, sometimes are very funny, and sometimes they cut to the, to the core. Wit is another thing that, you know, one has, to, has an obligation not to make one the victim of one's wit is a fairly new understanding of how we do and do not thrive. And the more we understand about our psychological makeup and our, our religious and spiritual and physical makeup, the more obligations we collect. So there's a core principle, but from, all, from that core principle, many, 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 many principles are spun off. Um, I've already talked to you about how you have this universal, don't lie, and then you're asking yourself at any particular time, does my action conform to that principle? Will it be consistent with a prohibition I recognize as important? Will it be inconsistent with an obligation I feel is important? Now that's going to mean that whole classes of action are entirely off the table. Bullying, off the table. Doesn't matter if you bully Sam. And, he, and, and the world will be a better place because that kid's a monster. Doesn't matter. Bullying's off the table. Cheating's off the table. Betrayal's off the table. That doesn't mean we live up to our principles all the time. I'm not going to tell you I never lie. But it is never the case that lying is justifiable because it'll have good consequences. Now, sometimes you're going to be put in this pickle of a situation where you have two obligations that seem to be pulling on you at the same time and you can't actually honor both of them. That's the language deontologists use, to honor an obligation. You can't. You have to choose one because human life is complex. But then, from the deontological perspective, you're actually not uh, intentionally violating a pr one principle in the, in the service of another. You have no choice but to choose a principle that will have the, the you know, the, the uh, I don't want to say consequence because we have to be careful with our language here, but we'll, we'll have the flip side that you simply are thwarting that other principle. Like what? Let me see if I've got this up here. Mm, no, so let me give it to you before I go to that next slide. Let's imagine that I'm the only uh, general, gladiator style, Russell Crowe, who could save my nation 
if I go to, if I'm called up to war, I'm the only one who can do this. On the other hand, there is no one to take care of my elderly mother, and if I go to war, she will die because there'll, there'll be no one to take care of her. And, and imagine a scenario where that's actually true, and you can't just you know farm her off to assisted living or whatever. It's either you and she lives, or you go and she starves, or you go fight the war and you could save your your citizenry, or you don't go and all those people die. For a deontologist, those are the big dilemmas. But you are, in the end, going to have to make a choice about which principle, honor my mother and my obligation to take care of her as I promised, or honor my country and my obligation as I am a conscripted soldier to protect them. So deontologists recognize conflicts, but they aren't, they aren't actually thinking that it's good, morally right, to not take care of my mother. In fact, it will have the secondary obligation that I will try to do everything in my power to get somebody to take care of her, if that's the choice I make to go to the army, or vice versa, that I'll try to find the best person to replace me in that, um, in that war. Okay. For deontology, it's one of its strengths is that it believes of itself, at least, and I'm, I can argue this um, if we have time, that there have always been universals across every culture, across every time and place. Now, they sometimes look different. Modesty, for example, looks very different here, as it does in Germany, as it does in a conservative Muslim country. And yet, we all care about modesty. We just care about it in different ways. So there are, uh, for the deontologist, uh, one can, uh, a, a deontologist feels very confident that morality is universal, that relativism is not a threat, for example. It's also unyielding in tough cases. When it comes down to the question of should you torture someone to win a war, the answer is a resounding no. On the other hand, it's unyielding in tough cases. So you, I don't know if you notice here, because I don't have a laser pointer, but I showed you that, uh, that one of the strengths of deontology is that it's unyielding. One of the issues of deontology is that it's unyielding. And it is thought to be, rightly so, by the consequentialists, to be quite rigid and inflexible at times. Also, it lends itself to the dirty hands problem. I don't want to get my hands dirty by torturing someone. So is there a consequentialist around who might be willing to do it? So it has this problem of, I don't want to get my hands dirty, but I can see what you're saying here, that 100 million people are at stake. Another issue. Uh, it is not demanding. There are so many rights in deontology that sometimes the consequentialists can rightly accuse deontologists of being quite lazy. If you have to think about whether, and none of you have one, I usually have somebody with a Starbucks cup, but if you have to think about whether that mochaccino could have been better served in cash to UNICEF, then that's a very high moral bar. Whereas when you're a deontologist, you have an obligation to help others. Well, you know what? I held the door open for somebody when I walked in, so done, right? So it can be a fairly low bar. Deontologists uh, feel that they are you know, quite proud of themselves because they don't lie, and they don't cheat, and they don't steal, but they don't do that much in the world either by demand. There might be people like Mother Teresa, but that's not called obligation. You've heard of this word probably. That's the supererogatory. Have you heard this phrase? Above and beyond the call of what? Duty. Duty is the minimal bar. Above and beyond the call of duty, great, ha have at it, but it's not my obligation. That's sainthood, martyrdom, the people that are really you know, good soldiers in the world. On the animal problem, big worry for the deontologists, because who's got infinite value? We do. So when Peter Singer accuses us of being speciesist, he's got a good point. Because deontologists turn themselves into a pretzel, trying to figure out how to love animals, how to care, morally I mean, about animals. Deont uh, consequentialists don't have any problem with animals. Do they feel pain? Yes. Well, then they count. I, mean, I don't know how much pain, you all tell me, but it's pretty much now assumed that they do, and that's why they get anesthesia when you're spaying them. So basically, it's easy to put them into the calculus. Maybe they don't have as much as big a glass 
of pleasures or welfare as do uh, the, the human animals, but, the, uh, but it's easy to put them into the calculus. If you start with infinite value, and the reason you have infinite value for a Kantian, for a deontologist, is because you can act morally, then unless you can show me an animal who can act morally, they don't actually count. Now Kant tries to get out of this by saying, yeah, but it makes us look bad when we abuse animals, or it kind of debases our nobler nature to be cruel to anything at all, great, but that's not that much uh, consolation to the animals who don't count. Deontologists have a real problem with animals and what to do, unless of course neuroscience comes to the rescue and shows us that the birds really are moral, and then we have an easy problem dealing with them, but a big problem with concretely, now what do we do? So either way, deontologists are struggling. I've already talked to you about the conflicting values problem. What do you do when you've got two moral uh, problems? I talked to you about the defend country, take care of mother example. Here's another one. Not, of course, a possible thought experiment for Kant, and yet he used it. He just didn't call it Nazis because he came way before the Nazis. He was German. He talked about the corrupt police officer. The corrupt police officer rings the bell, ding dong. Do you have an innocent person in your house? And now you have a choice. Lie and say, no, no innocent person here in which case you have now put that person's life in jeopardy, or, um, I mean, have saved that person's life, or do you tell the truth, oh yeah, she's in the back, and now you've basically cost somebody her life, but at least she didn't lie. Okay, well, those are the conundrums of deontology, and um, I'm sorry to tell you that Kant thought you should tell the truth <laughs> in that case. So uh, one of the nice points that that illustrates is that Different deontologists will disagree, just like different consequentialists will disagree. I often, when Art Kaplan was the director of the Penn Center, I used to say this in class every year, Art and I agree on every, oh, just about everything, but he's a consequentialist and I'm a deontologist. And then I could trot out some deontologists and say, we disagree on everything, like maybe Mylander at Yale, and yet we're both deontologists. And it's the same with me and Kant. I am pro-PAS, and he's very anti-suicide, so if he were alive today, he'd probably be anti-physician-assisted suicide. One more slide to go through, and then we're going to do cases and let you all get involved here. I'm going to talk about virtue ethics for just a second. About 25 years ago in the field of philosophy, this theory called virtue ethics was thought to be a third way. And some of you may still think it is, but in general, the field doesn't. Moral philosophy tends to think it can be subsumed under either consequentialism or deontology. I'm quite partisan. I've taken Aristotle for myself, and I believe virtue theory can be housed best under deontology. The central question for virtue theory is how ought one to live, and if you think it's a maximizing Thing, uh, theory, you probably think it's consequentialist. I don't, so I'm going to steal it for deontology. The idea there is that the virtuous act is when you do the right thing at the right time for the right reason. It's very um, contextualized. But notice this slide that I put up earlier where I talked about all the duties we have. If you steal virtue theory for deontology, then you simply say we have an obligation to be just, kind, generous, tenacious, courageous whatever, and you have a obligation to avoid the vices of light-mindedness or cruelty or um, capriciousness, and there are so many. So deontologists have now sucked up virtue theory, and they've argued that it's made deontology much more nuanced. Now we can talk about the obligation you have to not inf uh, uh, be um, uh, whatever, rude, for example. In, if, if you, without virtues, without vices, it's very hard to talk about the nuances of human behavior that we all agree we want to hold ourselves to. For example, if I am rude and you want to say you shouldn't be rude, and I agree with you, I ought not to be rude, though I often not am, but if I, I, you rightly say to me, I ought not to be rude, and I don't have virtues or vices as part of my suitcase that I talked about, my arsenal of moral obligations, then I've got to say something very vanilla like, well, because it violates the respect for persons. Well, you're pretty far 
uh, an abstraction when you say respect others and you're really talking about don't be rude. It doesn't let you fine tune what you're saying human beings owe to each other. That's the reason why deontology believes that these nuances that we get from these adjectives we call virtues, well the nouns, but the, the, the description of being just or kind or generous, help us fine tune what kind of obligations we have to each other. All right. So, in summary, and then we'll get to two cases and let you get in here. We have talked about consequentialism, where what you're going to do to do moral analysis is think about all the consequences, benefits, risks, uh, um, costs, and uh, not just for that stakeholder, but for other stakeholders, and you're going to mine the case for what kind of consequences will fall and uh, ensue, and then you're going to think about your scale, and do you have a million kumquats and one kumquat, or do you have an orange and a grape and a grapefruit on one side and a couple of uh, apples on the other? How does the weighing and balancing go? That's how you do moral analysis when you're a consequentialist. If you're a deontologist, you're going to open up your arsenal of moral obligations and you're going to say, the reason that's wrong is because it is rude, or the reason that's wrong is because it violates the obligation to keep a promise, or the reason that's wrong is because um, to betray someone is to undercut one of the core fabrics of relationships. You're going to look in your moral suitcase and you're going to judge the actions and the options based on what's in that suitcase.